The following presentation was recorded live in Los Angeles, California for the 24th Annual Convention of the International Association of Square Dance Callers. This is tape 21, Teaching Examples, How People Learn. Good morning. Good morning. Well, that was better than the last try. That's good. I want to welcome you to the teaching tips session that we're holding today, teaching presentations. Probably one of the biggest problems that we have in square dancing today is appropriate teaching techniques. So we want to address that. We hope that you'll have some input that you want to share with us as well. I'm Laurel Eddie Mosley. Most everybody knows me as Laurel Eddie, and that's fine. I got married, and that other name is a real pain. So Laurel Eddie is fine. He knows it. I've told him. Um, I'm from Macon, Georgia. We have two panelists who are exceptional teachers, and we're real pleased to have them. Last night, you met both of them, Jerry Hardy. Y'all give her a big hand. And, and Doran McBroom, and they're going to be sharing lots of ideas on what our philosophy is of teaching. Yes. Um, we've given you some handouts. We hope that those will be helpful, maybe not even just today, but later on in your teaching processes. We've also given each one of you a four by six or five by seven note card. We hope that you'll hang on to those because what we'd like for you to do is as we go along, if you think of a tip or technique that you use in your teaching that you think would be beneficial for the group and for our tape, which everything is being taped, so we'll ask that you speak into a mic whenever you share anything. We'd like for you to briefly jot it down on the note card, and then we'll have a question and answer session, and during that question and answer session, we'll take any tips that you want to share with us. Then we'd like to take up those note cards, hang on to them, and maybe at some point in the future, use those to compile some sort of pamphlet or booklet that would uh, give especially our newer callers some ideas on how best to teach certain moves. So if it's, if it's a certain move or it's just an idea in general for overall teaching, we'll be happy to take those. If you look on the handout, I've said that the art of teaching is completely and totally separate from the art of learning. Learning doesn't always take place when, as a result of teaching. Just because you teach doesn't mean anybody's learning anything. If no learning takes place, then teaching is in vain with no visible results. And unfortunately, I think if you go out onto a square dance floor today, in a lot of cases where you have new folks coming into our activity, you'll see that although we've been teaching these people for 30 weeks or 24 weeks or however long, that oftentimes the learning process really hasn't sunk in. The statistics say that you have to do something five weeks before it becomes second nature. So if you teach Alaman left on your first night of classes, those folks still aren't going to be completely comfortable with it until lesson or week five, even though they've danced it each week and usually for two to two and a half hours. That's something that I think we need to recognize and realize in our teaching process because what they learn this week, they aren't going to remember next week, and we all know that. And we have to review, but a lot of us will review next week what we do tonight, and then the week after that we expect them to remember. So we might need to continue the teaching process for an extended period of time. It is not a one-night shot. Sometimes you have to teach two, three, four, and five times. Now, what is teaching? I'd like some ideas on what is teaching. If, you, if you'll give me the idea, I'll put it back on the mic so it's on the tape. What is teaching? The imparting of information. Okay, that's a good one. Anybody else got anything? Oh, come on now. We're all teachers. And, and somebody made a point yesterday that when you pick up the mic, you're a teacher, whether you're calling a, uh, teaching a class, doing a workshop, or just calling a dance, you are a teacher. You had an idea. Sharing of information back and forth. It becomes a two-way street then. Okay? Uh-huh. Breaking something down into its component parts. Okay, so, so that you can analyze each piece. Any other ideas? Yes. Leading someone to a discovery. Between two of you, you've almost hit on my definition of teaching. Okay, let's take one more. Having 
having the ability to put into words what you want someone to do and having them being able to complete the task? Okay. Okay, hang on. Let's put you on a mic. If it's, if it's going to be a long definition, we'll put you on the mic. Here we come. Norm Crosha, California. Uh, sit back to back with somebody and have them have a piece of paper and a pencil. And you draw a square in any part of your paper. Tell the, have the other person describe how to draw this square and exactly where it is on the piece of paper or any kind of diagram and have them relate what you have explained to them. So it's a verbal transfer of knowledge, in other words, okay. Well, my definition of teaching is sharing knowledge with someone toward a given destination or end point. When you begin the teaching process, you know where they're beginning if you've done your homework and are teaching in a way that you should be. You ought to know where your folks are. If you've got folks standing out on the dance floor for the first night, you know they don't know anything except maybe what they've seen on television. And we all know we have to go back and reteach all that. So we start at a given point, and the teaching process is to take them to a given destination. And that one night, it may be to learn how to circle left and circle right and keep the feet on the floor without bouncing up and down. Okay? That, that sounds reasonable. Or it may be to teach them eight new calls. It doesn't matter what that destination point is as long as you, in your mind, can, can put a definition on it. You know where that ending point is. Okay, so now we have what teaching is. What is learning? I think that one is a much more difficult concept to understand than teaching is. Learning is to listen. Okay. What is, what is the definition of learning in your opinion? Grasping information. Okay. Acquiring knowledge permanently that you did not have. These are all good. Any other ideas? Okay, okay. <laughs> Comprehending and being able to reiterate what was taught. Now, my definition of learning is, is, is probably much more basic than that. My definition of learning is reaching that destination. Doesn't matter where it is. The concept of teaching is knowing where a destination point is and taking someone from beginning point to the destination. My concept of learning is having someone reach the destination. If they've reached the destination, then they have taken in the overall thought process. Now, people are different, and we all know that because we deal with them on a daily basis. And there are five basic styles of learning. Oftentimes, we as callers don't take those five, those five uh, styles of learning into consideration. Uh, they're on your sheet, and I want to go through them one by one just to make sure that we're all on the same plane. The first is rote learning, and we've all been there. First grade or third grade. Third grade, you sit and you say, one times one is one. One times two is two. Two times two is four. Three times three is six. And every single day, oh, three times three is nine. Okay, I am not a rote learner. I am not a rote learner. I am not a rote learner. Guess that's evident, isn't it? Three times three is nine. <clears throat> I, di I can't eventually get to it. <laughs> I, ca I can count. Um, all of us have... <laughs> Watch it about Georgia now. All of us have been in situations as rote learners. Again, I am not a rote learner. I think I learned my multiplication tables about... 11th grade, because to sit down and memorize it was very, very difficult for me. I also am not a very good module caller because all those things start getting mixed up and where the right and left through goes and where the start through goes and the pass through, those don't make sense in my mind. As, as teachers, we have to realize that we are going to have some people in our class who only learn by rote learning. They only learn if you do it over and over and over and over again. Those are the people that we have to be real careful for because it may take them a little longer to do it because repetition is so important. And oftentimes the other people who learn through different styles become bored. And you don't want to do that. So you have to find a balance there. The second type of learner that we want to talk about is the auditory learner. 
There was an old saying that if you tell me, I will hear. If you show me and tell me, I will understand. We're going to come back to that, but I want you to keep that in mind as I talk about the auditory learner. Some people, I can say, to do a, a pass through, I want you to walk forward, passing by the person in front of you, right shoulder to right shoulder, remembering the right shoulder rule. Once you are back to back, you stop. And they say, oh yeah, I got that. That's no problem. I mean, that's a real elementary example, but that's, that's the process. I can tell them what to do. I don't even have to look at them. They can carry that out. I can tell them to square through. I can give them a definition for square through and just talk them through it. They've got it. They understand only what they hear. Now, the third group sort of piggybacks on that second group. These are the visual learners. Some people cannot figure out what you're talking about unless they see it. Show me a picture. Draw me a picture. And we know those kind of people, right? You, you know, you're talking along and they go, what are you talking about? And you say, see that sign right there? See, you follow that sign to the following sign, and there's another sign right around that tree. They're the ones who give the directions, like you go down the dirt road until you get to the big pecan tree, and when you get to the pe big pecan tree, you're going to look to your left, and there's a red mailbox that's going to have its flag up. When you see the mailbox with the flag up, you turn to the right. Those are people who notice things, notice the things around them. They tend to be much more observant than the auditory learner. The auditory learner is going to hear everything. They're going to know all the conversations that are going on in the room. The visual doesn't care, but she can tell you, or he can tell you everything that the people in the room had on, all their clothes. I mean, they can describe the clothes. So you see a, a variation in that. Those are the kind of people that when we teach, we have to be real careful that we provide them some sort of picture. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, you drag out the old sets and order book that has the visuals in it, you draw them a diagram, or you get a test square out there and demonstrate how the move is actually executed. Those people have to be able to see something in order to learn. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that there are some people who are auditory and visual learners. If you tell me, I will, if, you, if you tell me, I'll hear, but if you show me, I will hear and understand. Those are the kinds of people that you have to tell them a definition and then show them exactly how that goes into practice. The fourth style that I really want to concentrate on is the analytical learner. Analytical learners are the, public, uh, the puzzle solvers. And, and those tend to be the folks who will later on go to other higher levels. Mainstream's not going to be enough for them because they're going to want to solve puzzles throughout. You have to break things down for these people. You have to say on a spin chain through, okay, you start turning half by the right. And they go, okay, got that piece. I can do that. And then you say, then you're going to turn left three quarters, those who can, and the center are going to turn left three quarters, and they say, okay. Now, is that going to put me in a, a wave down the middle? And you say, yeah, you're going to have a wave. Down. Okay. And they say, okay, I got that. And then you say, now, here's what's going to happen. And they're going to have to look at each individual part of whatever call it is. It doesn't matter if it's a circle left. They're going to try to break it down into little pieces. We have to be able to do that, and our definitions are the way we do that. We have to be able to um, be sure we understand our definitions well enough to convey that information to our analytical learners. They also want to then be able to reassemble that information. They're the folks who generally are going to become callers. Now, you all may have some, some of these learning styles in the way you learn. We adapt because we go through schooling and we have to learn how to adapt in order to survive in the world. But most of us would probably fall at least partially into the, into the category of analytical learners because we're going to take it apart and then we're going to put it back together. And we may not like the way somebody else put it together, so we're going to put it together a different way. It's still going to work, and that's why we have different calling styles as well. The fifth is my favorite. They're the emotional learners. Emotional learners are those people who have to have some emotional feeling, some, some feeling to tie into whatever they're learning. And my favorite example of this is walk and dodge. With walk and dodge, I had, I had a lady, this is my grandmother, I hate to tell you all that, who she couldn't get walk and dodge, bless her heart, she tried and tried and tried, she couldn't understand it. So finally I said, okay, I want you to think about we're going to the grocery store. And we're going to come back out and we've got the groceries. And the little fella that comes out of the grocery store with the groceries, he's going to help us. Okay? He's your fella. Somebody's going to slide the van door open 
And the person who was, that's the Dodger. The Dodger slides the van door open. And the other one's going to put the groceries in the van. And she went, oh, isn't that just so sweet, you know? Oh, you know, like you're taking care of your family. And I thought, okay. <laughs> that's the way she learns. Everything is tied to something she loves or something she doesn't love. She's got a feeling behind everything that she learns. If she's going to read the newspaper, she's only going to read those things that touch at her heart. She's the one who's going to read every one of those human interest stories and doesn't care if the world has blown up on the front page. That's irrelevant. We do have emotional learners in our square dance clubs, and we've got to be able to draw word pictures for those kinds of people. Those are the, the, those are the most difficult for me. Because you have to find an emotion in which they can draw, from which they can draw, in order to convey that message. So as we're beginning to teach square dance moves, most of the time these people have no idea. I mean, these words are completely foreign. It's a whole different language for them. We have to figure out where, and we don't want to ever pigeonhole anybody, but you have to kind of categorize or group people into one of these five styles of learning and be sure that you meet the needs of each one of these. Now, a lot of times a caller will come up, and, and I've done this on countless occasions and just been so sick at myself afterwards, and I taught it one way. I said, this is the definition. This is how you do it. Go. And they went, what? Except for the two people who on the, on the floor went, okay, here, and you go here, and you go here, and they're trying to fix the other six people. You can't do that. Oftentimes, we have to teach in two or three different modes or methods each one of these learning styles in order to do that. So we've already talked about these, but just to recap before we turn it over to, to Jerry and Doran, the ways that we facilitate learning of these five styles for the rote learner, we're going to use repetition. We're going to call right and left through a thousand times when we're teaching. We're going to call square through, four hands, three hands, two hands, one hand, until they understand that concept. Okay? The second style for the auditory learner, we're going to break things down into very easily understandable terms. Normally, you wouldn't use any word that was over three syllables. If you've got to use a word that's over three syllables for an auditory learner, then you've used a word that's much too big, buy one of those little nickel words for that. Make a, make a substitution in there. For the visual learner, a lot of times demonstration squares are your answer. You want to go for putting a square on on the floor, use your angels, show them exactly what it looks like. For an analytical learner, those graphs and charts and pictures, they like checkers. They, they want to play with things. I mean, you know, they're the ones who sit at the table with the salt shaker and the cream and pitcher and play with them after the dance to make sure they understand how it goes. They also, we also need to be able to provide definitions for those people because they have to have it in words that they can take apart and reassemble. And again, for those emotional learners, you have to create a word picture in one form or another. So now that we understand sort of how people are going to go through the learning process and how we need to meet the teaching process, I'd like to turn the mic over to Jerry Hardy, who's going to share with us a little about our own teaching and learning experiences. Jerry? Thanks, Laurel. I'd like to speak to you callers as empathetic callers. And I don't have a handout to, to hand out to you on empathy or because all of these things are my own feelings and my own instinctive subjective feelings about the caller as an empathetic teacher. Uh, the handouts that I gave you are just teaching tips that I thought you might want to use. Uh, feel free to crit criticize them, test them, challenge me on them. Uh, they're just ideas that I picked up from teachers that I've had as a dancer and just teaching tips that I use and have kind of developed in my teaching. Empathy, according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is the experiencing, the experiencing as one's own the feelings of another. And I think the callers have to be empathetic when they are teaching. Why? It promotes the teaching process. How do we do this? Well. I believe that the caller is a catalyst between the music and the dance. He is literally between the music, the turntable, 
and the dancers. He is right between. So he is a catalyst. He makes things smooth between the music and the dance. He is dancing the dancers to the music. He has to be sensitive to the music. He has to feel the beat. He has to know the correct choreography, having taught the calls. He has to know the tune, if it's a singing call. He has to be able to sing it smoothly and in tune. He has to know the instrumentation of that particular hoedown or the, the singing call so that he can relate to whatever instrumentation is, is in the singing call or the hoedown. But he has to be sensitive to the dancer's individual skills as they're dancing on the floor. <laughs> he has to make it successful. The square the square makeup, the corners have to be there. He has to produce less stress as much as possible. He has to look on their faces to see what's happening at the time. Are they successful? Are they feeling good about what they're doing? He has to recognize the enjoyment. Are they enjoying themselves? Are they having a good time? And he has to recognize if they're enjoying these connections that they're making throughout the square. Are they having a good time? I think he can do this by actually being a dancer himself, either before he's a caller or actually, if he can, get on the floor at some time and be a dancer. Whether it's with your own class, and I have the fortunate experience to have a caller as a husband, so that when he's calling, I can dance and vice versa. But if you can get to dances, I know all of you are very busy and you, you go out to clubs and, and, are, and are calling to lots of different clubs besides your own. But if you can just get out to a dance and be there with the dancers, I think you really will have the experience, especially in a class, of what is going on in, in, in the square. Of course, you always have the intimidation factor. That's why we have a purple heart dangle, I suppose. Um, I was just recently in my last class, last Tuesday night, Chuck was calling and I was in the square and all of a sudden everybody kind of straightens up and they say, oh, teacher's in the square, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and it can be intimidating to the new dancer, but you have to do something about that. You have to relax them by accepting responsibility for any mistakes that are made. Accept it. Put it right on your shoulders. You can take it. At my club, when I make mistakes, they mark them on the board. <laughs> they do. I, I, they really do. <laughs> Somebody just asked, how, how big is the board? It's a big blackboard right be, behind me, and it's really very, very great. It's really great for teaching. In fact, last Tuesday night, I used it with a clover leaf, and what a picture I drew. But they got the clover leaf beautifully. I was just so pleased with that. But that's your visual learner, too, and most of them got it through that visual picture right on the blackboard. But they use it for other things, too. <laughs> uh, there's an example that I'd like to give of two callers that we dance to a lot uh, in, the, in the Northeast. They're both excellent teachers, excellent callers, but they, they have different relationships with the dancers. They produce beautiful dancers, but one can criticize or not criticize, I can't use that word. One can correct mistakes in a way that you don't feel like you're being corrected. He has a manner about him that you feel like, well, this is just what happens. You know, sometimes you make mistakes and sometimes you don't. But the other caller intimidates or makes the dancer feel as though he's really made a mistake and that he better not do it again. So I think... There are wonderful teachers in square dancing, but we have to be very careful how we um, correct mistakes. I said last night at the banquet that I would relate, you know, my fiddling experience. And you have to remember, a fiddle is a violin. Yeah, there are no, there's no difference in the instrument. It's just how you play it in the style of music and probably have some fiddlers out there. In fact, I met one in the elevator. Um, but my... <laughs> he was fiddling. <laughs> Somebody just said he was fiddling around. Well, anyway, I won't go there. 
<laughs> but anyway, uh, my fiddling story, um, I started the, um, the lessons with the fiddle as a result of a birthday present. I've always wanted to play the fiddle. I've always enjoyed fiddle music. I've always enjoyed dancing, and fiddle music just makes me want to dance. So I asked for my birthday uh, to be given fiddling lessons, and of course you have to rent a fiddle. So my mother-in-law gave me the fiddle lessons, 10 weeks, and my, my husband gave me the rental of the fiddle. And it wasn't until July, my birthday's in May, it wasn't until July till I had found a teacher and actually found um, how to get a fiddle. Now you think a music teacher would you know, have all these connections and everything. But actually when I called around, the prices were outrageous. But when I found the teacher, she told me exactly what to do about, about renting the fiddle and everything. Well, I started, and there was a complete role reversal here now. Here's the teacher as student from the very beginning. Now, granted, as a music teacher, I came to it with certain skills, my ear being the primary one, how I hear music and how I can translate it to the instrument. Uh, but other things using two different hand positions with my left hand doing one thing, my right hand doing a completely other thing, holding the fiddle, this instrument that's kind of coming out from my neck, you know, that has to be held in a certain way. All these things I had to adjust to, and um, as a student, whenever I would come to the lesson, I would feel great intimidation, really, because she was so wonderful. She was really outstanding, outstanding fiddle player. And certain things that happened during the lessons, I could relate to a student square dancer because they come to us knowing nothing. They come having to use their feet and their hands in certain ways differently. Their hands are doing different things than their feet. Feet are primarily just walking forward and doing something they've always done, but their hands and, and their bodies are going to be turning in all different ways. So this I could relate to the fiddling learning process. I kept a log. I thought that was kind of important since Jerry Reed contacted me after this, uh, my fiddling experience had, had started and I thought, oh, maybe I can tie this in in some way. So I kept a log and, um, I didn't really start the log until a little bit after, but interesting to go back and see all the feelings that I had. Again, there's that word, feelings, about the learning process. There was, um, a bit about performance whenever I would have to play I never played as well for her as I did in my practice room I was great in my practice room I was fantastic but when I got in front of her I felt like I couldn't do a thing and sometimes our students feel that way especially if we're in a square or if they are singled out in some way they, they feel like they're on the spot and they never do as well. Also, the angels, too. Um, I've always been told that you should ask the angels way ahead of time if they're going to be a demonstration square or a couples that are demonstrating a particular. And, and that's true. You have to be sensitive to their feelings about getting up in front of people. Because even myself, in the last teaching techniques with Doran McBroom, I was making mistakes and people were saying, wake up, Jerry, wake up. But I wasn't worrying about my corner and all that. But at any rate, I think <laughs> the caller in the square, I was wondering where that corner is. Um, the example factor is, 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 uh, is one thing, too, that I'd like to talk about. Um, she would always play for me. and and. This is something I wanted to strive for. I really want to be as good as she is. And I've been told various things about demonstration squares or teaching or having a square get up and do a complete plus program in front of class members. My teacher in the Northeast during the first class night would have a mainstream uh, demo square so that the class people could see where they were going to be a year from now. There might be controversy about that. I'd like to hear your feelings about that. Do we show people where they're going to be a year from now, or is it too intimidating? Someone just asked to who? To the new class people. Is that... 
because they Here's the mic. I say, when you have a demonstration square and you made it up of angels, sometimes the angels themselves are back in class because they've just graduated and they're getting a re uh, affirmation of what they've learned. And if you're putting them up as a demonstration square, the pressure's on them not to make any mistakes. And lo and behold, they make the mistake. That was Al Al Nappi from Mountain View, California. That's very true. That's very true. Um, I think that um, the commitment we need to make, the future picture of where square dancing is going as a lifelong activity, is is very important. I believe in giving this gift of the dance to these dancers. They're going to be in this program hopefully they'll be in this program the dancers that you've got that you've really just brought along nursed along um, I, I really feel that this is a gift that we've given them they can dance universally it's such a wonderful gift they're given the gift of dance and they should be able to do it with joy the universality of the language we have chinese dancers here that are going to be demonstrating uh last june chuck and i danced with japanese dancers at kirkwood lodge it was so wonderful the involvement of of other countries and the callers that we have here i think it is just such a wonderful activity and such a gift that we give them for what is it maybe four dollars a night at the max four or five dollars a night it's a skill that they can use forever into their 80s and 90s i'm sure you know dancers that are dancing that long am i going over it all i'm okay okay now i've kind of talked about the caller and myself my own relation to um the student being the student and and feeling what it's like to be a student what about the dancers themselves as they're dancing? I, I like to think of the square as a four-walled living house. For 15 minutes, those eight people are working together, cooperating. It's the most unique dance form in the world. It really is. They have to cooperate. They have to smile, get along with each other. There's socialization. There's a lot of dynamics going with, uh, within that square. And you as a caller has to be sensitive to what's going on when it breaks down, what you're supposed to do. The hand connections that happen. Just touching someone else um, is an electric kind of a, uh, a dynamic that goes on all the time. It's a dance of hands. Rough hands, smooth hands, small, large, strong, weak, nervous confident you know what it's like it's a dance of hands the choreo and the timing have to be smooth and flowing so this dance of hands continues and and connects and everybody feels as though everybody is working together it's a sliding gliding step that uh, is not difficult to teach but it makes that dance of hands really really happen I'd like to see everybody as Tony Oxidine would say every dancer should feel that wind in their face so that they're just gliding right along and they're feeling as though it's fun to dance this new beginning that we have I'd like you to feel that these dancers and you are making the connection that you can make the connection with the dancer that you as a caller are the catalyst and can make that connection between i think you'll keep the dancers that you have if you make that connection connect with their names everybody should have badges a name is a person identifies a person as special as a teacher i have to learn 400 names not every year I have to learn kindergartners names every year because as a music teacher I have the children for five years so I know their names over a period of but I have to remember 400 names inevitably I get children that are sisters and brother or sisters <laughs> or brothers mixed up because of that uh, connection they have um, mentioning a specific dancer um, I just had an experience in Dorn's uh, teaching techniques where Dorn said, Jerry, this way. And I want to tell you what it's like when someone mentions your name. 
<laughs> You're thinking about that for the next at least, well, I am anyway. I don't know how anybody else feels. I'm thinking about the fact that he mentioned my name and I made a mistake and everything for the next 10, 15 seconds or, you know, and then it kind of fades away and everything. Now, I, you know, as a, as a, you know, performer and a caller and everything, I take that. But some people, you know, really, really you have to be sensitive to whether you use their name or not. And you may have some feelings about that. I know Doran does. <laughs> Uh, you have to get to know the people also, and through the class, I think you you really get to know them very well, and whether you can do that or not. I ask questions in my classes also. I ask, what formation are you in? And usually I get angels who answer it, but that's okay. At least the, the class people know what the answer is. I have them, uh, you know, answer as a as a group or... You know, I ask somebody in particular sometimes if I know, they know the answer. I like to get feedback from the dancers. Now, if you have, heaven help us, a whole class of like five squares, sometimes that's more difficult. I have two squares. We have a class in my current club of only seven people, but we are keeping them, and they loving dancing. They really are. The classes are smaller so that inevitably you, you, these connections maybe are they are easier to make and so th there's really no excuse for not making them get out there and really get to know these new class people so we can keep them thank you thank you jerry now we're going to hear a little bit about doran's perspective on the teaching process and teaching techniques as well doran thank you laurel I have a few things I'd like to share with you. <laughs> we may not get through all of it. I'd like to address uh, Jerry's comments first of all. <clears throat> Usually, you can get by with picking on someone. Occasionally, there are people that really take offense to it, and you need to be you need to be aware of that if if someone is is particularly sensitive to it but part of the teaching process is getting the people comfortable with what you're doing comfortable with having fun dancing listening to you following your directions moving to the music they're going to make mistakes no question about it so are you and you have to be comfortable with that as well you have to admit your mistakes when you make them and you know get over it just like they do you can make fun of them for the most part as long as you don't pick on one person all the time, unless it's an exceptional person. Okay, I'd like you to keep in mind what Laurel has told you about how people learn. And I'd like, to keep, I'd like you to keep in mind what Jerry has told you about how you need to have empathy for people that are coming into your beginner's class. Picture the first night of your beginner's class, and you have people coming in the door. What kind of assumptions can you make about how you're going to relate with these people. They know that they're coming to a square dance for the most part. They may think they know what square dancing is. You and I know they probably don't. But they do at least know what dancing is. They know they're going to be moving to music. You need to provide that for them. They knew who they came with if they came with someone. So they know who their partner is, even though you and I know we'll redefine that for them a little later. And they know they're right from their left. But most of them will make a mistake with that, right? <laughs> I mean, you demand that of some one time after time after time, they're going to make a mistake. So we can eliminate that assumption to begin with. But other than that, what assumptions can you make? If you tell them to join hands, make a circle, they understand that. That's about it. So your job is to teach them an enormous amount of material, understanding how people learn, having empathy for their situation and, and, and their feelings and the situation that they're in, with the assumption that they know how to make a circle. <laughs> okay? It's a task. It's a real task to teach people how to dance. My philosophy, I've taught somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 classes. That's 30-week classes and through mainstream. I've kind of developed a philosophy that I'm not particularly interested in 
first and foremost is not the choreography that I teach. I want people to learn how to dance the particular calls to the, the rules that we've set up. But they don't have to know what the rules are. They don't have to memorize the rules. I want them to be able to dance the rules. Dancing, moving to music. What we teach really is we teach people how to listen to and follow the directions of a caller. That's their responsibility. That's all they're responsible for, is doing what you tell them to do. You're responsible for keeping them all straight, keeping them moving in time to the music, and you need to teach them that that's what they have to do, is to listen to and follow directions of the caller. And you need to do that without telling them, look, you've got to listen to me. They don't want to hear that. They're not there to be lectured to. They're there to have a good time. So we start this whole process by <clears throat> operating on what they already know. We're not quite ready. <clears throat> First of all, I've seen a few different um, techniques of getting people up on the floor. People typically are not all that comfortable with just hopping right up there. I saw a technique not too long ago where a guy um, used a what he called a serpentine promenade, where he physically would um, go out and start like a Congo line, right? He'd grab people and say, come on, let's dance, and you grab this one, and you grab the next one, and, you know, and he'd just wander around the room grabbing people and pulling them up onto his line so he could get people up onto the floor for the, for the first tip. Well, if I were in the hall, <laughs> I don't particularly like being forced physically onto the floor. I was in another class dance one time, and this caller had a technique where he'd get the dancers to do his dirty work. He would um, have a square or two on the floor, and he would create a call like um, White Elephant or Snowball or something. And whenever he said that, then everyone on the floor would leave their partner, find somebody that was not dancing, grab them, and pull them up on the floor. So he'd double the size of his dance floor every time. Well, that's fine, except if you're standing alongside, you know, talking to someone, having a cup of coffee, and someone comes up and grabs you physically to pull you up on the floor. I'd be offended. In fact, I was offended. <laughs> right? I, I think that when we're teaching people to dance, we've got to have respect for them. They're adults. They know what they're doing. They know whether or not they want to dance that particular tip. Don't physically grab people and pull them up, up on the floor. That's just, it's not a very respectful way to, to teach, to tr treat people. On the other hand, particularly the first night of your class, you want to make sure that everyone gets up so you don't have to repeat teaching do it oh, and promenade and you know, on and on and on. I've found that most people are fairly comfortable in a big circle. I will try to coax them up without physically grabbing them. I will try to coax them up, telling them, look, I'm not going to hurt you. You know, give me 15 minutes, and if you don't have a good time, you can leave. You know? and, and we'll go on that way. If they really don't want to get up on the floor, let them go. Hopefully, you know, they'll see that everybody's having a good time, and they'll feel a little more comfortable, and they'll try it again. Then you've got to repeat, but that's the breaks. Okay? Could we, uh, I'd like to get a square up if we could. Keeping in mind that everything that we've told you here, how do you start this process? You want to teach people to listen to the caller using what they already know. We don't need very much here, but I want to be. Got it? Okay, all right. Okay, great, that's fine. Okay, first of all, these people all know how to square dance. They all jumped up here and... Um, they got into a square, and they have their partners on the right-hand side, but we're not going to make that assumption, okay? I just told them to get up and make a big circle. Just get up and make a circle at all. All join hands and walk to the left. Just walk to the left, one after the other. All right, that's very nice. Circle to the right, go the other way back. Now, they know how to circle left, they know how to circle right. Super. Circle to the left. And circle to the right. Now, I'm going to kind of compress this in time a little bit. You'll understand you have to keep going over some of this. Drop hands, single file, keep going. Keep rolling right along. Guys, step into the middle right up alongside your partner. Actually, why don't you step back to where you were? Get back to the circle again. All join hands, circle left. All right. Circle to the right the other way back. Drop hands, single file.
roll back and get behind her so that she is in front of you. Right? That eliminates the assumption that they got up to the square with their partner on the right hand side. Right? All the men now step into the middle right up alongside your partner. Shake right hands with her. Under right hand, shake left hands with her. They know how to shake hands. If you tell them to shake hands, they're going to shake right hands. Okay? So we have right hand over left hands. That's called promenade. Back out, all join hands, circle to the left. Now, I haven't stopped to explain any kind of rules to them. We're just talking English here. Face your partner. Okay, we're going to do a do -so -do. Now, everyone knows what a do -so -do is, right? And most of them say, yeah, that's what you do. No, we don't know that. Okay, with the person that you're facing, I'd like you to walk forward, right shoulder to right shoulder, and then slide back to back, and walk backward, left shoulder to left shoulder, and that's called do -so -do. Back out, all joined hands, circle to the left. Walk to the left. Walk right along and go. Circle to the right, the other way back, and we go through the whole review process now. They have something that they can dance with. Face your partner, do -so -do. There's a variety of ways that you can proceed from here. Okay, You can go into stars or whatever. Let's turn your back on your partner. This is what I like. Walk up to your corner, say hi. Shake hands with her. Drop right hands, shake left hands with her. And sneak it up to the elbow. All right, make a forearm grip, forearm to forearm. That way, if you tell them to join right hands, most of them will. A few may not. But if you tell them to shake hands first, drop right hands, shake left hands, you have a, a pretty good chance they all have a left hand. Walk forward around your corner halfway and come back to your partner. Tell your partner, that's called Alaman left. Do so do with your partner, right shoulder to right shoulder. Back out, all join hands, circle to the left. Face your partner, do so do. Turn your back on your partner. Aloe man left. That's your corner. That's the one we call your corner. Promenade with your partner. Somewhere along the line, we tell them your partner's the one on your right, your corner's the one on your left. Promenade back to where you started from. Right hand over left hand. Okay. Now, I will stop and say, now, the couple with their back to the music, back to the callers, couple number one. On the right-hand side of one is number two. Facing one is three. And on the left-hand side of one is four. Now notice that I keep everything in, in perspective of the square. I don't teach walls, I don't teach anything outside the square because I want them to relate to positions from the square, from the people that you're working with. One and three are what we call head couples, but I usually don't work that in until much later, five, six weeks or so. One and three step into the middle and back. Two and four step into the middle and back. And I would ask you, when you do use forward and back, give them time to dance forward and back. Keep that in your mind. <laughs> okay. From this point, we want to go back and review what they know. And we want to apply the positions that they now know. One and three, step into the middle. And with the person you're facing, straight across, do so do. Right shoulder to right shoulder. Slide back to back and walk backward, left shoulder to left shoulder. This is a little different position for them. Two and four, step into the middle. Do so do, straight across. Right shoulder to right shoulder. Back to back. Backward, left shoulder to left shoulder. Two and four, step into the middle. You four in the middle, join hands and circle to the left. One full turn around. And this is a little different application of a circle for them. Back out when they get there. One and three step into the middle. Join hands. Circle to the right. One full turn around. Back out when they get back home. Usually wouldn't do that the first time, but you understand we're compressing things here a little bit. Now we've done circles. Circle four. Circle eight. Circle left. Circle right. Dosado -do across. Dosado -do partner. We could dosado -do corner, but that gets a little tricky right away. You want, you want them to be too messed up with doing too, too many different things with one person. Let's kind of proceed. We've talked to... Um, okay. Let's assume that we've done ladies' chain. I do um, stop and explain the courtesy turn portion, and then I tell them that we never use a courtesy turn, right? Except in kind of using it in conjunction with other things. So we know how to do a, la a ladies' chain, a courtesy turn, that kind of thing. I get into situations where I want to start using all eight people at one time, okay, with facing couples. The only way to do that that i found is to tell them, couple number one, turn to face couple number two, couple number three, turn to face couple number four. Just turn to face them. And do so do straight across with the one you face. Same four people join hands, circle to the left, one full turn. Back out, all join hands, circle to the left. Now this just to get them kind of comfortable with the position. With your corner, Alaman left, and promenade back home. Home to go, sit right around, and then all the men step into the middle, put your left hands in, turn your left shoulder the same direction, and walk forward. Notice I'm just talking the words to them, okay? They're just following the words that the caller says. do so do your partner. All eight to the middle and back. 
Whoa! Couple number one, face two, three, face four. Dose it straight across with the one you face. So once again, you change the position a little bit and use the call so they know. Same four people make a right hand star. Turn the star one time around. Back out when they get there. Okay, now we've done, let's say that we've done a pass through, all right? We've done from head couples pass through and you turn back, side couples pass through and you turn back and then join hands and straighten out the ladies, okay? Another thing that I use, dose to straight across with the one you're facing and do a pass through, right shoulder to right shoulder with the one you're facing and walk straight through. Touch hands with your partner. You have to tell them. You'll have to tell them time and time and time again after you pass through. Touch hands with a partner. Touch hands with a partner. You'll probably say that, you know, hundreds of times in the class. Touch hands with a partner. I'd like you at this point to move forward around the square to the next couple. Do so do. Now, I didn't worry about the precision of a bend the line. I just told them words. Pass through. Touch hands with your partner. Move forward onto the next couple. Do so do straight across. Two ladies chain. Pass through. Move forward onto the next couple. Mm, right and left through. Let's assume we've done that. Right hand walk by and courtesy turn. Same ladies chain. I think I've lost corner here somewhere. Without relation to the wall. I, I, I worry about, I want them to, to, to be relating to the square, to the people that you're working with. Who's your partner? Who's her, who's her partner? Doesn't matter. <laughs> Pass through. Move on to the next couple, right and left through. Okay, ladies chain. We're getting close. Pass through. Move on to the next, right and left through. Ladies chain. I got him? Okay. And we're home. Element left promenade. Okay. Okay. Couple number two, phase three, four, phase one. Change it up a little bit. Right? Yeah, exactly. See, they're going to have to think about that. And they're going to make a mistake. But it's okay. So you want them thinking as they're trying to move to the music and listen to you. Pass through. Move on to the next couple and do a right and left through. Actually, I probably should have done something else first. Ladies chain. For sake of argument, pass through. Face your partner. Pass through. Alaman left. Center. We crossed them. I crossed them. Okay, that's all right. Promenade. Now go ahead and fix yourselves. For the sake of the tape, you'll have to fix yourselves if you're trying to dance this. <laughs> okay. One other thing we're, we're using here. Um, one in three, two ladies chain across. Now, imagine we've done a lot of different circles. We've done circles halves and, and full around and stars half and stars halfway around. So they're beginning to understand that they can circle one way and circle the other and circle fractional amounts. We've, uh, we've chained the head two ladies. I'd like the head couples to go into the middle and circle to the left three quarters. That's one half and then halfway back to where you came from. And we'll have two couples in the middle that are facing each other. Pass through, Alaman left with the corner. And back to the partner and we're home. I'd like you to realize at this point, this is either at the end of the first night or end of the second night, a sight caller has everything that he needs to resolve the square from anywhere. So you're absolutely free. You can go anywhere, you can do anything you want, and you have all the tools you need to resolve the square. That usually comes after star three, right? Once you have that ability. Once you have a circle left, ladies chain a circle left three quarters, you can resolve any kind of combination as long as it's symmetric. Couple number one, phase two, three, phase four, right and left through. Ladies chain. Pass through, move on to the next couple, right and left through. Pass through, move on to the next couple, do so do straight across. Same four people, I'd like you to join hands, circle left, three quarters, that's a half, and halfway back to where you came from. Pass through. Alaman left with a corner. And square your sets back at home. Yes, yeah, three quarters of them. We're talking, we're, we're compressing time now. We're talking like in the four and five weeks here. Uh, this is Rich Real Hayward, California. I was just saying, I don't like not being related to walls. I think that's very difficult, especially on the three quarters. Okay. One and three, two ladies chain. Could have used the side couples, I guess, to give the heads a break. <clears throat> One and three into the middle and uh, join hands. Circle left halfway. 
and back out. Two and four go into the middle and back. Two and four ladies chain across. Let's keep myself straight here. Two and four into the middle and join hands. Circle left one full turn. Now you're circling with the other couple, right? A full turn. Good. Back out. One and three into the middle and do so do. <clears throat> Same four people in the middle. Join hands. Circle left halfway. So once you have them working with one couple in, in fractional circles, okay, I understand that the three quarters is a little difficult concept. I, I agree with that. But in the long run, if you have them relating to the people in the square rather than relating to something outside the square, they're going to be better off. I've seen people, after they learn um, wheel around, I've, I've called the class groups that will do a wheel around and then try to arrange the square so that they have their backs to the wall so they're facing the wall. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's cumbersome. That is cumbersome. To, to try and expect people to dance that way, that's not dancing. That's not moving the music, in my opinion. One and three into the middle, join hands, circle left. Full turn. And we just did that. Okay. How about four ladies chain straight across? We do. Okay. Couple number two, phase three, four, phase one. Now we're trying to build on things. Realize, you know, keep in mind that this is compressing time quite a bit. So we're trying to relate one thing to the next. We're trying to build on just a little bit at a time. Two ladies chain straight across. Pass through. Move on to the next couple. Now by the time you get to teaching Ben the line, they've been moving on to the next couple for quite a while. Okay? Pass through. Now realize that you have a line of four people. I'd like one couple to face the other couple. So the center people back up a little bit, the end people walk forward a little bit, and we've done a bend the line, so we have one couple facing the other. Eventually, we'll get away from the move on to the next couple, and we'll replace it with bend the line. But for your initial contact, you can get that action going by having them move around the square to the next person. That also, you know, walls. You can't use walls when you're doing that. Okay? We don't have walls arranged here. Pass through and bend the line of four people. One couple face the other couple. Good. Pass through. Move on to the next. Eventually they'll say one is the other. What's the difference? Okay? Don't worry about it. Pass through. Bend the line. Bend the line is just a little more precise than move on to the next. Two ladies chain. Okay. Pass through. Bend the line. Join hands. Circle left. Half. All join hands. Good. Aloe man left somebody. And square your sets. <laughs> and square your sets. Okay, you guys want to take a break? Go ahead, take a break. Thank you all. Very nice. quick statement. Uh, I know of a club that danced in a school building that has 13 walls, all of them irregular, so there was no question of dancing two walls. Sometimes you just have to make do. Gloria has a question. I have a question. Uh, first of all, when do you uh, suggest that they start listening to the music and when do you teach them how to dance to the beat? Right away, right away, okay. The second thing is, with all the dos a dos that you're doing, uh, dos a do is one of two moves in square dancing where we literally back up no-handed, and I consider that m perhaps the reason why so many people do waist swing dos a dos is that they have been dos a do to death. And I wondered, uh, also, the other factor about dos a do is it is one of the calls that we do bring over from our traditional dancing. Uh, and I wonder if you don't think that's sort of an insult to the intelligence to do that many dos a dos without moving on to something more interesting. In, in other words, after 50 years of teaching and having two or three classes a year, uh, I stopped doing dos a do. And the third comment I have, I mean dos a do to way, way, way into class because it's superfluous as far as choreographical management. And uh, But the thing is, I noticed on one of the papers here and also that you did, and Alaman left, and um, Laurie related the Alaman left uh, 
um, as taking like five weeks before they get it straight. And one of the reasons people have trouble with their alum and left and remembering is because when you do a later or very soon on first night, I'm hoping, a grand right and left, they meet their corner first. It took me about 25 years of teaching classes before I realized that's why it takes them so long. If they don't do the Alaman left, and it's just as easy to teach them without, till after they have learned grand right and left and have it firmly planted in their mind, they only need one night of learning Alamand left and that is without exception and a lot of I know when I teach callers you know in my school they are astounded because they have all learned from their teachers Alamand left on the first night and it gives them such a difficult time to uh, orient themselves to who their partner then is because they meet their corner on a grand right and left as they come around before they meet their partner. So I would just submit that some of you think about that in teaching. I have found over the years that they never have any trouble with an Alamand left if they haven't done it before they've done Grand Rant left for two or three weeks anyway. That's all. Okay, last question first and then I'll try to back up for you. Um, I don't teach the routine Alamand left, right and left Grand. When I first introduced right and left grand, it's face your partner, do so do. <laughs> I saw you do Alan and left by itself. I know that. Okay. I'm about teaching it first. Ahead of, ahead of right and left grand? Okay, well, they're two separate calls. I, will, I, I don't use it. I know. I don't use it initially like an Alan and left, right and left grand. Okay, it's. Excuse me. I am talking about the call. That is not the point I was making. I was making the, the point that a right and left grand has you meeting your corner first, regardless of if you taught it uh, 10 weeks later, a grand right and left. It, you meet your corner first. That is a fact. No one can question that if you know your square. You know that you meet your corner first. Therefore, if you teach an Alaman left in the progression of your teaching, I'm not saying do Alaman left, grand right and left. Okay, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the instant they have done an Alamand left prior to Grand Right and Left, that's why it takes five weeks for them to understand Alamand left. Do you do, let me ask you this question, do you do a Grand Right and Left on the first night? Yes. Uh, then that answers the question. It, so do I. And I think that should be done first. They get a great deal of pressure out of Grand Right and Left, out of pleasure. All right, it's the Alamand left introduced the first night is what I'm saying that does cause the pro problem okay okay I think I think if I understand right your, your problem is once they get accustomed to doing an Alaman left before they do a right and left grand on the right and left grand they'll meet their corner and it's someone familiar with them and they want to just stop there okay when I when I teach right and left grand it's first of all face your partner do so do so they get kind of comfortable with that facing the partner and it's four hands right hand walk by left hand to the next person walk by right to the next person walk by left to the next person walk by so it's their corner becomes like the third person in the sequence that they're just walking by when you get to the fourth person that's your partner stop that fifth that's where we we're fifth person right and left grand is four hands but to the fifth person. To the fifth person, I agree. Okay. Walk by that left hand. The next person is your partner. Is your partner. Usually, yeah, do so do. That's the most convenient thing to do. Um, so, so, I was passing on information that I know helps. That's all. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, Cliff Simpson uh, from Palm Springs, California. I have. Uh, uh, a couple of things to say and then a, an observation. Uh, Ed Foote, and I'm sure everybody knows who Ed Foote is, uh, put out um, a thing, and, and I pass this out to my beginner dancers, and he goes through a lot of things telling you what to do in square dancing that'll help you out, and right on the bottom of it, he's got uh, two major reasons square break down. Number one, people don't hold hands, and number two, you don't listen to the caller. Uh, inside of a... in. In listening to the caller part, I tell everybody, now we only have three hard, fast, absolute rules in square dancing that you must follow. You have to follow these. And rule number one is you got to listen to the caller because if you don't listen to the caller, you're not going to dance. Now, now rule number two is, you know, probably more important than rule number one. And, you know, I, I, you, you kind of stretch it out, but for short term, rule number two is listen to the caller. And rule number three is more important than rule number two or number one, and that is listen only to the caller. But I noticed you, when you started out there, you just said hold hands. 
And I notice it doesn't matter if I'm teaching, if I'm calling a beginner's class level dance or a C3A dance. People break down because they're not holding hands. And when I get people in a circle, and this is just I'm not putting you down, don't get me wrong, but it's just an observation. Why don't you tell them, okay, get those hands up. If the hands go below the waistline, we go in bowling. If they stay above that waistline, we're going to square dance. So get the hands up, palms up, like the book says, and ladies' palms down. You know, men's palms up, ladies' palms down, and keep those hands up. And I hear a lot of students who are going to double class and say, well, my caller never says hands up. And I guarantee you, every night at class, my students are going to hear, are your hands up? They're going to hear that at least 50 times every night. So that's an ob just an observation that I saw. Okay. It's uh, the hands, the whole hand styling thing is something that it takes a little while and it does need to be explained. Initially, though, to get people moving to music, it's not as important as long as they get that hand joined. Okay. They're going to feel it. It's going to come naturally, eventually. And you're going to tell them. The other thing, as far as you've got to listen to me, I don't think people want to hear that. You know? You've got to listen to me. <laughs> I don't want to listen to you. I'm going to leave. You know? I mean, they have the ability. Boat with your feet. Sure. Uh, same person again. As a Marine Corps drill instructor, I could sit down or not, I could stand there, put my hands on my hips, and my recruits, if they were talking, they knew they better shut their mouth. Teaching a college course, if the students were noisy, I would walk to a desk and I would sit. And they knew when I sat, that meant they better be up there teaching the class. With square dancers, obviously, we can't do that. And I can't get people quiet. We've got a lot of angels there. What do angels do? They talk. They are there for recreation. Hardest thing they can do as a square dancer is be an angel. That's a tough job. We all recognize that. One thing I found to keep people quiet is you can't sit there and, could I have your attention, please? Could I have your attention? It just go, shh. And you'll hear everybody quiet down. And you'll maintain that control just by going, shh. And everybody be quiet, and they've got to listen. And you say, are you listening? And a lot of times, you know, as they get to know you, and they feel comfortable with you, then you can say, if you're talking, you're not listening, shh. So, you know, they, it is important. And that's why I say, even Ed Foots brought it out with all his experience, not holding hands and not listening to the caller. So I believe those are the two main points that we need to pr impress from the very first night. Thank you. I won't say any more. <laughs> I would agree with that. I've developed a little technique to keep people from listening. Keep people listening. I don't give them time to think otherwise. Okay. We're going let me I'll tell you what let's do. If you've got any of those cards now that you have a teaching idea or technique, if you'll write these things down, you don't have to do it before you speak, please get those to us be, before you leave the room because we do want to take this session and, and take it another step further. So we want all your comments, but we'd like to have them on those 5 by 7 cards. If you want to speak first, um, why don't we just come up here and you can use either one of these mics and that way we can see who's speaking as well. Must disagree, Doran. <laughs> it's a dance of hands. Didn't we say that? My name is Ernie Kenny from Fresno, California. It's a dance of hands, right? Then why should we put off the hands? I talk to my dancers when they, they form their circle, their big circle, and I say, if you're holding hands with your partner, it's the man's palm up, the lady's palm down. I'd like to get that changed, but it's still that way. I'd like to see right hand up and left hand down. But we haven't changed it. We haven't seen fit to do that. If we're facing shoulder to shoulder, it's still cross palms. Still cross palms. It's not a squeezing. And hands shoulder high to the ladies. If we're meeting, it's still handshake. It's all based on this. This is where we got the thing in the styling committee. It all is based on hello, partner. And sure. if we hold, if we hold hands. It's still the same cross palms grip. And if they learn this properly the first night, and that's the dance. We're going to shake hands, pull by. We're going to shake hands, well, yank by. <laughs> Dave Harry, I, I teach a lot of people, and, I, and I'm learning constantly each time I go to something. But to me, the finesse of a good teacher is to be able to teach somebody without them knowing and it doesn't matter if the whole building is is just 
loud with noise. If you can get your point across to those people without them knowing that they're learning something, I think you'll, you'll find that those people come back to you. Um, circle to the left, what the handholds are. When I'm uh, teaching circle in, the, in my first night of class, I don't teach it. I tell them to join hands and circle to the left. And as they're circling, I say, oh, by the way, guys, palms are up for the guys, palms are down for the girls. I don't have to stop the square and say, before we circle, boys, your palms are always going to be up, your palms are going to always be down for girls and whatever. But you can finesse that information in while they're dancing. They came to dance. They didn't come to get a lecture. If they wanted a lecture, they would have taken a college course and brought a pad and paper with them. Dancers come to dance. The more music you can have on the, on the machine and the more things you can do while they're moving, the longer you're going to keep in the, and the more satisfaction those people are going to have out of dancing. Wolfgang Benden from Germany. Nora, I think you are using a lot of directional calls, especially during the first weeks of the class. I think it will go very well or without a lot of problems. If you stay in an environment where English will be the native language for the dancers, but if you go away where English is not the native language, I think you will have a lot of problems, especially in Germany we have this one. We can't use directional calls during the first weeks. Either we will uh, speak English, then nobody understand us, or we'll talk German, and there are no longer directional calls. We say in German what to do, but all the dancers know it isn't a call. It's a, it's a command to do, but not a call. <laughs> yeah. Quite so. Different technique. Betsy Gata from New Jersey. And I have two points I want to make. Number one point has to do with arm turns and the teaching thereof. And uh, for this demonstration, I need another person. Okay. Now, uh, the secret to it, notice that I have taken off my jacket and I rolled up my sleeve. The secret to an arm turn is in the upper arm muscle. We all have one, whether or not we look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. We have an upper arm muscle or the arm doesn't bend. Period, end of sentence. The whole secret to a forearm turn is not in the opposing thumb. And I try and teach this early. Close your thumb up, Dave, and don't put it. Now push with your palm as we turn. The whole secret to a turn, smooth and tight, is to push gently on the arm. Same thing works for uh, an ocean wave with a cross palm. Push on my hand, and I'll push on yours. If you push equally well, you have a smooth, tight turn. Too many people don't learn this, and they somehow end up with their thumb grabbing. You know, the harder I grab with my thumb, the more the turn will be tight and smooth, and people have imprints on their arms, and we lose dancers. So if we can teach the gentle turn that is smooth, and you can demonstrate graphically, um, you push on my hand, and I'm not going to push. <laughs> we just went all over like a dead fish. And you can demonstrate this in your class. That's, that's my first thing, and I think we need to pay attention to the fact that the opposing thumb is used far too often to get smoothness into a turn. Thank you, Dave. Next, for the next one, I want to talk about um, square through, because I approach it a little differently. Can I have four people? What's that? And I'll write it. I'll write it down. Four people. Doesn't matter. Sex is irrelevant. Sex is irrelevant at this point in time. I thought a few years ago, you know, of teaching square through that we're doing it backwards in a lot of cases. Most of us teach, and myself included, for many years teach square through four hands, and then we break it down into fractions. And I always thought maybe we should build it up. So I start by teaching square through one hand which we all agree has little choreographic value, but it gets a lot of points across. Smile at the person who's across from you. That's a very important person in your square through life. So pay attention to them. Smile. Now, shake hands with them, because that's your right hand, and we all know that easily. Walk by, passing right shoulders. Let go immediately as soon as you get shoulder to shoulder, and you have done a square through one hand. Notice that you don't turn anywhere when you square through one hand. Everybody just turn around all by yourselves. You turn back, and we've taught that. Now, shake hands with that opposite person again. That's that same important person. Square through one hand. Right hand, walk by, let go, and you're done. Turn around. Now, square through one hand feels a lot like pass through, doesn't it, guys? And I'll say this to the dancers. So we don't normally square through one hand. We go for two. 
two is very important. For two, you need not only this important opposite person, but your important current partner or the person next to you. Look at them and smile. Okay. Now, when you square through one hand, in order to find that current person next to you, your current partner, you have to turn. The direction that you turn to look at them will be the same direction that you turn. Okay, shake right hands with your opposite, smile, walk by, let go and turn to face that partner. Which way was it? Give them a left hand. Shake, shake hands with a left hand because we have to have an equal opportunity for hand use. And walk by passing left shoulders and adjust so you are back to back. There are adjustments needed because we each have physical mass of some sort and we can't pass right through each other. Although I've been told that it's theoretically possible to align the molecules, I've never seen it done. And from there, I would continue with square through two hands. And I would work square through two hands for quite a while before I went to three. Maybe the next tip or something. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Betsy. Um, we are taking any teaching tips, and it can go at whatever at whatever level. I think we would like to maintain it at maybe a mainstream, basic or mainstream level. But we will take anywhere on that list. Gene Arnold from uh, uh, California. Redlands. Um, good. The only thing that, that I would like to add to the square through uh, for, I think, a good teaching tip is we talked about, and I am a teacher, by the way. I'm in the education system. We talked about teaching to an endpoint. Um, the thing that I do with square throughs immediately before they go anywhere is to tell them where the endpoint is. I want them to know where they end up so that when we get there, they will know they're correct. So the first thing I have them do is to face their corner walk in, face the corner, this is where you're going to end up from a square through. From a home position, we don't know all that yet, and static squares is where we're going to end up. So I have them walk in, face the corner, and this is where we're going to end up. There's no doubt in their mind that they're going to be across the hall or facing anybody else. They're going to end up facing this corner that they're familiar with. And then I go back and, and do some of the things Betsy was talking about to get them through. But I think it's important for people to know we're talking about all the different ways of teaching. Um, everybody is not spatial. Most everybody uh, is tangible. Uh, so the, the touching of hands, as Ernie suggested, and so on, very important. But um, knowing the end point of a figure, I think, is one of the most important things you can work towards. Bill Stone, I'm out of Washington State. But I have a, uh, I've been taught by some pretty fair callers over the past 37 years how to do this stuff, some of it. I can't see any problem with, with square through. I never have anybody try a courtesy turn, and I teach right and left through first. I never have any problem with it at all. Because the first night I teach pass through face your partner, I want them to know where their partner. <laughs> and I just keep saying pass through, face your partner, pass through, face your partner, pass through, face your partner, pass through. All right. It's a very easy thing, and I can't find a problem with it. What Bill is trying to say is we establish a traffic pattern, and teach is easy. Once you get the dancers doing a traffic pattern, and uh, Dar Doran was talking about resolving a square, a pass through and face your partner is a star through. And they can do it the, the minute they learn to identify a partner. Partner's identification. You know, if, if you're in a, your normal boy-girl situation, he's, he's my partner, even though you're, he's, you're oh, trying to... You're trying to <laughs> trying to establish this. We pass through and face the partner if this happened to be the boy person. And uh, wait a minute, I've got the microphone. <laughs> so, so we uh, we're going to come on, dummies. We need two two more dummies. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Once again, it doesn't matter. Sex doesn't matter. We've learned to identify our partner as the person beside of us, beside us facing the same direction we're facing. We haven't learned that yet the third night of class, but we're doing this the third night of class with our, with the static setup. So we pass through, face your partner, pass through, face your partner, pass through, face your partner. Not a new partner, it's your partner. And pass through. I got him. He's here. He's my partner. It's We've taught these people that, that their partner is the person on their right, facing the same direction they're facing. The and we chain. We tell them the first, we tell them when they do this the first time, hey, you got a new partner over there, so be careful who you're looking at. And uh, so you can resolve your squares 
And I, of course, I use I use uh, the old goalpost method, and and we we dance singing calls the first night of class. No, I'm going to let you have it. Come in, sit down. What's goalposting? Oh. Can I do it? Give me a square. Give me a square. Now, folks, <clears throat> this I'm, we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about the first night of class. After we come from the, after we come from the Sicilian circle or the big circle, if you don't know what a Sicilian circle is, after we come from that, we go into squares, and I promenade them into squares, in in the old grand march thing, and get them into squares, and we teach them after we get into squares who they are. We identify our positions, and uh, like we have a partner on our right guys and the girls have their partner on their left and the guys have their corner on their left and the girls have the partner on their right we used to talk to the guys you know in the olden days when women didn't mean anything <laughs> get back over there and hush it's actually because the women can do it backwards <laughs> okay we're going to start with the heads and and we teach them to pass through pass right shoulder to right shoulder would you please now, we show this. We demo, demo this with a demo square first because all eight people are involved. All eight people are involved. Now, head separate. Girl go right, boy go left. Go around one person. Side spread apart. Let them come between you. Come into the middle. Side slide back together. Side slide back together. Side slide back together, dummy. <laughs> okay, the sides are acting as the goalposts. The heads are acting as the, as the active people. Pass through. Split the outside two. Separate. Round one. Come down the middle. Pass through. Separate. Round one. Come into the middle. Pass through. Split the outside two. Separate. Round one. Everybody swing your partner. If you're doing a singing call, it works out perfect right there. And all promenade. Now, let's take it. You don't have to promenade. I think you know that. You can use this throughout. Heads. Once we were teaching California twirl tonight. Heads, California twirl. Separate. Go round one. Come into the middle. Hold hands. California twirl. Careful. Got to be careful. Split the outside two. Separate. Round one. Down the middle. California twirl. Separate. Round one. Into the middle. They're dancing. California twirl. Woo! Left out a man with a corner bow to your partner so you can take this on through partner trade you can take it on any any as far as you want to go anything that fits anything that you do in square dancing remember if you can find a traffic pattern to lead them into this heads pass through and courtesy turn this is as soon as they learn a courtesy turn what are we setting them for two weeks later three weeks later heads give a right to your opposite pull by Courtesy turn. What have we done? Oh, we did. Let's let's give it a name. It's called a it's called a called a right and left through. Let's call it that. From now on, when I say that, you give a right, walk by, yank by, <laughs> and do a courtesy turn. Sides. You try it. Pass through. Courtesy turn. Give a right to your opposite. Walk by. <laughs> courtesy turn. And speaking of speaking of of get outs and things like that, we can start. Um, what's the definition of circle? Left or right? What's it say? Have we read it? it? Says two to eight people. It says two to eight people. That's what it says on the definition. Two to eight people. If I want to do a right and left through the first session in class, what do I do? Heads, circle left halfway. Pass through, face your partner. Pass through. What have we done? What position are we in? We've done a right and left through and a star through and a pass through. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to define it some way. So, uh, yellow rock. <laughs> okay, we'll take Jack's comment and then we'll wrap time it up. up. I'll do this yeah. real fast. We'll do this one and then we'll wrap we it up. We need a square. I want to uh, try to emphasize one important point to me. I'd like people, when they teach beginners, to break up all the cliches.
quit teaching them. Make sure that you try to help the people have experience doing different things. Now, I'm going to show you a set of figures that has three cliches in it, and I break down floors if I'm not very careful of plus dancers like this, but my beginner's class can all do this very well. One and three star left. Face the corner couple, make a right-hand star. Corner couple, make a right-hand star. All right, come back home. Come on back again. That's the first one. They're used to doing a square through. They don't think about a star left. Ready? Look at your corner. Memorize the corner face. Remember who that is. Now, one and three star left. We don't use a square through. We use stars. Right-hand star with a corner couple. Come back to the center, make a left-hand star. Here comes the second one. Go all the way around to home and everybody circle right. That's the third one. Here's the fourth one. Ladies in men's sachet. Take a new partner promenade. Beautiful singing call figure. Smooth and the dancers love it. But I have trouble every time I try to have them circle right out of this when I say ladies in men's sachet to the right, most of them have never done anything except ladies in men's sachet to the left. Those are not hard calls. They're just simply that callers in teaching them never taught them that you could circle right as well as circle left and do a half sat and do a ladies in men's sachet. Watch it one last time. Just see how it flows. Two and four star left. You put this into a singing call and it's a beautiful figure. Right hands up with a corner star right. Back to the center with a left hand up star left. All the way around to home and everybody circle right. I think somebody didn't get back home. Circle right. Sorry, I'm going too fast. I usually, with experienced dancers, I'm more careful. Ladies in men's sachet to the right. Take a new partner promenade. Beautiful combination of figures. And it breaks up at least three and maybe four of the cliches that I would like to see every teacher spend time breaking up so people don't think you can only circle right, I mean circle left and do a ladies in mint sachet. Or that every time you get in the center and go to a star on the side, you come back to that for a right and left through or swing the corner. Uh, try to take a look at everything you're teaching and find cliches that are done over and over and over and over the same way and try to find some way to vary it as you teach so the dancers won't get their mindset that when I hear somebody say square through star right, I already know the whole rest of the call and I'll just go ahead and do it. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry to take that much time. Jack, according to uh, this, uh, I'm looking in the definitions, there's a problem with that sachet to the right. Uh, oh, it does. Ladies in men's sachet doesn't include that. If the circle is moving to, but the last sentence says, if the circle is moving to the right, the men's sachet to the right. Yeah, it does. Let me tell Never you, mind. though, That's Caller Lab two years ago at this Caller Lab meeting took care of that for us. We uh, had one call, and I can't remember which call. I have to go look it up. Which we removed from the list, a left-hand version of that call. We removed it because the guy who presented it said, we don't need that. It's already something you can do. If you've got a right-hand version, you can use a left-hand version. So we don't need to list it. And I thought that was wonderful that they said that because we already do several things on that basis that if you can do a flutter wheel, we can do a reverse flutter wheel. If you can do a wheel around, we can do a reverse wheel around. In Europe, they do beautiful things with reverse wheel around. And nobody has to learn a new call. All I have to have is a caller who taught them to listen and do what I said, not make up your mind with a cliche and think that every single time I say circle, it goes to the left. And every time I say ladies and men sachet, I do the same thing. Thank so you. I'd appeal to anybody teaching beginners, try hard to break up your cliches and let them learn to listen to the caller and do what he says. Thank you, Jack. Um, I think what we've learned today, if nothing else, is that preparation is the key to the teaching experience. We must know what we're doing in order to convey any sort of cohesive and coherent information to our dancers.